So it should be recording and let's head over to the screen share, start broadcast. So ideally this should be now visible. Can you see my screen? Lovely, that's, that's a good starting point. And thank you very much, Bernardo, as always. Um, what would we do without you? Fantastic service. The good thing is that uh, the exams will be uh, anonymous marking. So I would not be uh, able to tell who submitted what exam and people then would not be uh, able to accuse me to then reward people like Bernardo uh, with good marks. That's, that's, a, that's a good thing, isn't it? But if I could, uh, Bernardo, I certainly... Well, let me put it this way. When we are all going back to sort of normal, then um, maybe we can all uh, have a sort of coffee or so. Well, I think uh, one mark is might be a little bit under generous. Oh, uh, no, I no, I think for the summary part, all you need to do is fill in uh, the uh, the bits. I think. I can't remember at the moment. I need to check. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. I, I've, I've written it such a long time ago, I really can't remember things. Okay, let's get started. I think the, the chainsaw has uh, quite down uh, a little bit. And so let's get started, because today, in the, this session today, and probably the session next week, are really, really crucial for a good grasp of statistics and data analysis. And in a way, um, um, how shall I say, um, it all comes back to a question that Edith asked um, in the session the week before last, because Edith really asked the question, and, and that was a brilliant question. It was sort of the cue for me to uh, to focus on that. It had asked the question, how on earth can we convert percentages into p-values? And that's an absolutely brilliant question. So what we are going to do today is we will do the first part of this sort of conversion, if you like, how we get from data to um to p-values and try to do that in a sort of a more general version uh, because that then can be applied. And uh, in order to sort of make things a little bit more tangible, I thought I uh, use an example which is uh, absolutely brilliant. It can be abused in so many forms that it is absolutely brilliant. And this example that I've chosen has something to do with intelligence and how you measure intelligence. So usually you have these IQ scores, you do a test or something like that, and then it spits out an, an, an IQ score. And uh, you can do that online and you, uh, or, or sometimes it's done in assessment centers and all these things. To be perfectly honest, I really think 
This is nothing else but a lot of BS. And nobody in their right mind should take these things too seriously. So what I'm going to do today with you is, uh, indeed, it, it is a scam, right? But it has been used for very bad things, actually. And uh, we might come uh, back to that uh, even if it is a very, very dangerous territory that I might enter. So let's have a look at um, IQ scores. So let's assume we determine the IQ scores <laughs> oh, it is uh, not just discrimination. They have been used for gen genocide, actually. And um, a lot of other things. And that is not a good thing. So, but let's not dwell on that. Let's just simply take these IQ scores. And uh, let's say we determine the IQ scores for uh, 100,000 people. And it's just arbitrarily chosen. Um, and the way these scores have actually, or these, these tests uh, have been set up originally was that uh, people do this test and the test is then scored. And you would usually, half of the people would, uh, or, or the, how shall I say, the peak of this distribution of scores would be around 100. You score 100. Uh, so here on the uh, x-axis, you've got the IQ score. And here on the y-axis, you have the number of people who get uh, a particular score. And uh, what you can see from this, uh, from this distribution here is uh, you can look at that, and that is a typical, what is called a frequency distribution, because we count the number of people who have a particular score. The way I think I've set it up is I've... Wow, that was good. I think everybody is awake. Oh, whew. Yes. Um, so uh, I've set it up in a way <laughs> uh, that uh, it is not just uh, full numbers. I think it is in steps of two. But uh, let's not worry too much. So the way you read this frequency table is, for example, an IQ score of 100. Uh, we've got about 8,000 people, 8,000 of these 100,000 people who would score an IQ of 100. And from this distribution here, what we see is we have a majority of people between, let's say, an IQ of 60 and 140. You might find people still who have an IQ of higher than 140, but there are not many around. Likewise, you might find people who have an IQ less than 60, but again, there are not many around. Um, you know, uh, and I, I'm not going to make any uh, jokes about people with particularly low IQ scores and uh, that you find them, for example, a lot of them in, in government or something like that. that. That would be totally inappropriate. And I'm not saying anything like that. Uh, we, we are uh, blessed with very intelligent um um, government and leaders. So that's, you know, uh, just, 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 just to make sure that uh, that's all right. So we can do these frequencies. We can also say, you know, um, 
Okay, we have 8,000 people of these 100,000. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I, you're absolutely right, and I'm not going into that. So we've got 100,000 people, 8,000 of them have an IQ of, let's say, 100 here. So I can say, uh, what is the percentage of people who have an IQ of 100? Well, that's very simple. I can do a frequency count. I have roughly 8,000 people with an IQ of uh, 100. And I just simply divide that by the total number of people that I test. So that's 100,000. And that would give me uh, 8,000. So 8 over 100. So I would say 8% of the people will score 100. Um, does that make sense? Likewise, I can actually rephrase this question and I can say, what is the probability that out of these 100,000 people somebody scores IQ of 100. And that's exactly the same thing, because I know that 8,000 of these 100,000 will score that, so my probability would be 8%. Yeah? So in a way, I can very easily uh, take this uh, frequency and calculate a percentage from that. I can also do the same thing and say, you know, uh, how many people actually score less than 80? So all I need to do for 80, I just simply say, right, 80. I want to know who scores 80 or less. So I take this uh, a value that's about 3000. Then I take the one down here and the, I add them all up. So I add all up these, these people here who are 80. And uh, so 3000 plus, what's the next one? That's probably 2200. Uh, who are scoring this one, and then maybe 1,700, uh, and so on and so forth. I add them all up and divide by 100,000. And I actually get then the number of people, so the frequency, frequency of people who have an IQ of less than 80. Why 100,000? Th 100, because I told you at the beginning, we determined, we determined the IQ score for 110,000 people. 100,000 people. So that's our, all of them, the 100,000. And I just simply add up all the people who have an IQ of less than 80, and I basically get this, uh, this number. And also the same thing, the probability. So if I say the probability, I did this number here, um, would be, I don't know, 80, I can do 85, uh, might be, let's say, 20% or so, yeah? So maybe 20% have an IQ of less than 80. And what I have done is I've added all these numbers up, right, that are here. So in a way, I added this number, this number, this number, this. I added them all up down even to probably zero if we've got somebody with an IQ of zero which is rather unlikely because in humans, uh, to be a human, you would need an, uh, a certain threshold because otherwise you are as intelligent as a slice of um, 
stamp uh, bread or something like that. Um, so this is how we can use a normal uh, frequency distribution. And no, I don't want to hear anything like that. Okay, so that's a frequency distribution. What can we do with that? We now can also convert this frequency distribution that we have into what is called a probability mass function. Probability mass function. And that is abbreviated with PMF. So all we need to do is we really just do what we have done. We convert the frequencies into percentages or into probability, which is exactly the same. So for these um, 8,000 people who score uh, 100, we just calculate that. That, that would be a probability score of 0 0.08 or which is equivalent of 8%, right? So what we now get is instead of the frequencies that we have here, the number of people on the y-axis, we get the probability of a particular score. So this is again, this uh, distribution. The distribution does not change at all. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, we just simply replaced the frequency axis on, on, on the, on the y-axis with the probability of getting a score. And likewise, again, what we can do is we can calculate what is the probability of getting something lower than 80 just by simply adding up the probability of getting these individual uh, points here, but now they are no longer frequencies, they are probabilities. And that is the probability mass function. Now a probability mass function will be used if the, uh, if the data that you have, if the data down here are whole numbers. If these data are whole numbers, or we we'll just simply say discrete data. Okay, so we have an IQ of 80, we have an IQ of 81, 82, 80, but we don't have anything in between in our test. Then we would use uh, this probability mass function, and we get these discrete data points here, yeah, which I've indicated with these dots. But what if these numbers are not whole numbers, if they are not integers, if we could get a uh, if we could get an IQ score of, say, 80.356. Now, we can't use this probability mass function with the individual dots anymore. We would actually use a sort of a, uh, a smooth curve like you see here in this diagram. Again, we have the IQ scores, but we no longer have this 80, 81, 82, we actually have things in between. So 80.345, for example. And as a consequence, we still have the probability on the x-axis. And this would be exactly, we are working here now, instead of with discrete data, we are working with continuous data continuous data because we have got 80, 80.345, 80.567, something like that. So this is continuous data and we no longer have these individual dots sitting here. We have a smooth curve here. And you've probably noticed again that um, 
I don't know what the discontinuous variation graph is, uh, but uh, stay with me because we will discuss what these uh, data then uh, look like. So, um, what we are dealing with here is now called a probability density function. Probability density function. compared to the mass, because this density indicates um, that we are now working with continuous data, and that is a PDF, not portable document format. It means a probability density function. The probabilities, if you compare that with the PMF, you see that the probability goes down dramatically. Uh, before that, we had, for this point, we had 8% probability in the PMF. That is just simply because now we also have probabilities of in between, uh, say, um, 79 and 80. And we need to account for that. And uh, therefore, our probabilities here are really quite low. And in fact, if you think about it, what is the probability to get a score of exactly 80.0000000, you get the picture, zero, zero. What is this probability? The probability is probably very close to zero, actually, because you might find somebody who has uh, a 0 0.00001 somewhere, and that would not be covered. So the individual probability are going down, but as a whole, we would find that um, we get some probabilities with these continuous data. Now, the next question is, what is the sum of all the probabilities? What is the sum of all probabilities? Let me put this this way. The sum of all the probabilities. Together. People, or oh, let me rephrase the question. What is the probability that I find a person with an IQ score? What is the probability that I find a person with an, whatever the IQ score is? I assume you mean 100% or one. Absolutely right. So the sum, of the PDF is always one equals one or 100%. So I would, if I, if I look for a person with an IQ, it would be 100%. I can actually look at that in a slightly different way. I can say actually the Instead of the individual points adding up, I can now just simply take the area under the curve here. And I can add, or I should probably should not do it like that. I can say the area under the entire curve here For a PDF, then it must be right. The area under the entire curve for a PDF is always one. Is always one, the total area, right? And actually what I can do is I can 
do a sort of a slightly different curve. I can write, I can draw a graph which is called the cumulative distribution. Cumulative, cumulative, yes, distribution function. Which looks a little bit like that, where I basically say, uh, I just take the IQ score and then I add up the individual uh, area under the curve. So, for example, if I go for 100, I know that here, let me try to do that here. I would have 50% of the people, half of the people would have an IQ of 100 or less. And that is what uh, CDF shows me. I go to 100 and then look at what is the probability for that. And I find this would be 0 0.5 here. That means it basically gives me these values here on this S-shaped curve, it tells me actually what the, what the curve, what the area under the curve is. So in this case, at 100, it would be 50%. That's these 50% here, right? Or when I say I go to basically, well, positive infinity, so that would be over here, I would get 100%. That is what a CDF does. Okay? So I can do a PDF and I can do a CDF. And what you probably noticed is that this uh, curve that I just used, curve like that, this is a really nice bell-shaped form. It's also, that's why it's called a bell curve. Does anyone know uh, other names for that? A distribution can be anything. Yep, you are right. Uh, another very common name is a Gaussian curve because that follows uh, what this uh, famous German mathematician Gauss uh, discovered. It's a Gaussian curve. And in our particular case, this is also phrased as a normal distribution curve, normal distribution or normal curve. But what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, a little bit of notation, so terminology alert. We say that the IQ score, the IQ score, um, we treat that as a variable because different people have different IQ scores. And this IQ score, because we don't know exactly who has what IQ score, this is also called a random variable. Random variable. And random variables are usually abbreviated with a capital X. And in this particular case, the way the tests are set up uh, is that the IQ score, this random variable, which is the IQ score, is shows a normal distribution. And that is indicated with this uh, squiggly line. N, that indicates 
a normal distribution, we will come across other distributions or we have come across already other distributions, like for example, a binomial or a Poisson distribution. And that this normal distribution actually is defined by two population parameters. And this is usually written as the mean of the population, that is mu, that's the mean of the population, mean of the population of the entire population. And it also depends on another parameter, and that is the standard deviation of the population. So that's the population, population standard deviation. So these are the two population parameters. And basically what this here, this expression tells people that the IQ score that represents the random variable shows a normal distribution around the mean, the population mean, mu, of, um, with a standard deviation, sigma. That is what this basically tells us. It's a little bit abstract, but you see that quite often um, when people talk about normal distributions. So what can we do with that? We can, of course, we can now ask the question, um, what is the probability of, for example, finding somebody with an IQ of, let's say, higher than, uh, what shall we do, 130, All right? So, what is the IQ of finding somebody with, a, what is the probability of finding somebody with an IQ of higher than 130? No, that's not 130. So how would I do that? Let's say we do that here, 130. I want to find the probability of finding somebody higher than 30. How would I need to visualize that? Right. 130, that's here the IQ, 130. And we would like to find the probability here, this area here, right? So we want to know what is the area under this curve in this case here. What's the area here? We could, of course, also do the opposite. We could say, well, if we don't know this uh, black bit, what we can do is we can just simply say, this is the same thing as one minus the red bit. Here. So basically it's the same thing. So how do we find the area under the curve? Well, let's just go with the black bit here. What is, we want to find probability, probability of IQ larger than 130. So, how do we find the area under a curve? What would be the mathematical operation for that? Finding the area under a curve. What do you think? A 
Louis says, integration, absolutely spot on. So we would use the operate, and that's just simply basic calculus. We would need to integrate. So we need the tool of integration. We do a simple integration uh, of this curve and find the area under that. What we need for that, however, is the equation uh, that describes this curve. And there is no escape from integration. We need to find the, we need to use the uh, equation, and this is the equation for this bell-shaped curve. That's the function, and this function, that's basically y equals this uh, not terribly complex uh, equation. What you see is that this equation actually contains the two parameters. We have our sigma here, that's the population um, standard deviation. We have mu in here, that's the population uh, mean, and we've got an x here, and this x here, this x, is just simply the value at which we want to evaluate it. We want to evaluate the curve. So in this case, it would be 130. And the rest is just basic calculus. Um, you, uh, you have all done uh, calculus, you have all done integration. So really integrating this function, uh, I assume, is no problem for you guys. Is there? You can all do that. No. Hmm. No, the calculator can't do it. So if the microphones were on, I'm pretty sure I would now hear people going, holy fluff. How on earth am I going to do that? Do I have to learn calculus? Shall I let you into a secret here? Hopefully that makes you a little bit, makes you feel a little bit better. I can actually, <laughs> I can't integrate this equation. Actually, nobody can integrate this equation because this is an equation that unfortunately is not integratable. So nobody will ever ask you to integrate this equation. It just simply can't be done. It's one of the things that, you know, mathematical abilities are not good enough. But then how do we find that? How do we find the area under this curve? And that is what integration means. How do we find this area? Well, actually, what we can do is we can use our curve that we have here. And if we've got 130, let's say here, and we want to find the area under this curve, we can convert this into a slightly different curve by just simply converting 
the IQ scores that we have here into something slightly different, into what is called a normalized curve. And that is where the normal curve, where this expression comes from. We normalize it. How on earth are we going to do that? Well, what we actually need to do is we need to use our Z score. We need to use our IQ score. Here, IQ is 130. And we normalize this score. We actually do that for all scores that we have. We use this equation here. We calculate what is commonly known as a Z score. This Z score, or in the American version, is the Z score, which I don't like. This Z score takes the IQ score, this one here, subtracts the population mean minus mu and divides the result by the population standard deviation. So let's do an example for our IQ of 130. What would be the Z score? Z score or for IQ of 130. Can you quickly try that? Mu we said is 100 and sigma is 15. What would we get for the Z score in this case? For IQ 130. Absolutely right. So the Z score of two, what on earth does this Z score of two tell us? Well, the interpretation of that is that 130 is exactly two standard deviations two standard deviations away from the mean from 100 in this case. The Z score just tells us how many standard deviations a value is away. And we can do that basically for all of the IQ scores. We can start at, uh, say, uh, zero, for example. And we can convert this axis here to Z scores. And I've done that here. We've got here the Z scores. So here, this point here, this two, the Z score of two would be 130. Likewise, I can do a Z score going in the other direction, a Z score of minus two. The Z score of negative two would be 70. And the 115, this is what we uh, originally, what I told you that this uh, IQ tests uh, is set up so that we get a mean, a population mean of 100 with a standard deviation of 50. But we can use different values depending on whatever we are looking at. So Z score of 70, let's quickly calculate the Z score for 70. 70 minus 100 divided by 15 that gives us negative two. So a Z score of negative two actually means we are two standard deviations away, two standard deviations away, and the negative means we are to the left. 
two standard deviations above would be a positive set score. Does that make sense? So why on earth do we use this normalized PDF? We said before, we can't deal with the with this with these results and what's the point of doing this normalization calculating these set scores well the answer actually is people have tried to calculate the area not under this curve, they're unnormalized, but people have calculated the area under the normalized PDF. Calculated the area under the normalized PDF. And again, you would use this equation that I showed you before. Where is it? You would use this equation here, but now you would use it for the Z scores. You still can't do it, so you have to do some slightly modified versions, but we get area calculations for this normalized version. We can't get the area calculations for this curve. We can only get the area calculations for the normalized version. But if we've got that for the normalized version, then we just simply do exactly the opposite thing and move back into our non-normalized version. Sounds terribly complicated, but luckily there is a sort of a rule of thumb for the this normal normalized PDF. That's the normalized PDF with the set scores down here. And it turns out that we can use what is commonly known as the 68-95-99.7 rule. Yes, you can do that. And I'll show you uh, at one point how you do it. But what I want to do with you now is the so is this so-called 68-95-99.7 rule. What does this mean? The 68-95-99.7 rule means that if you are one standard deviation away, so if you are one standard deviation away, that's one standard deviation in each direction. In this case, the area under this curve for one standard deviation, the area under this curve is roughly 68% or 0 0.68. We know that one is all of it, 68, that is 68%. So 68% of people will be within this one sigma range. So 68% will be within one sigma range. Okay. So 68%, that's the area under this curve here, for one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean, which is in this case here, zero. 
That's 68. One standard deviation to the right and to the left. Okay, so that's this one here. Now you can probably guess what the 95 means. What do you think the 95 means? 95 actually means this one here. The area under the curve is 95% if we are two standard deviations away. Two standard deviations. So that's two standard deviations to the right, two standard deviations to the left. So that contains now, I should probably do that with a different color. Let's do it like that. Ha! It's like coloring in. This red bit here is 95% of the area under the curve. So it's 95%. Does that make sense? So two standard deviations contains 95%. One standard deviation contains 68%. And you probably can guess 99.7% are included in 99.7% are included in how many standard deviations? Absolutely right. In three standard deviations. So three standard deviations three standard deviations include 99.7% of all the data. So that's 99.7%. And I think um, you are now ready for me to make a confession. I just told you a lie. I lied to you. Yes, I'm a bad person. I know. I told you a lie. This affects actually this one here. I told you that two standard deviations to the left and to the right contains 95% of all the data. And this is a lie. But I think you are ready for the truth. Are you ready? Shall I tell you that? I'm debating. Because this value is not two. Shall I do it? Shall I tell you the truth? Okay, I'll tell you the truth. It is not two. Actually, a more accurate value, and it's a little bit like, you know, engineers working with, 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 with the number pi. Uh, you learn pi is 3.145 uh, and so on and so forth. A decent engineer will always work with just the number three for pi. And 
a decent statistician will usually just use the word were, were value of two. Two standard deviations contain 95% of the data. But a more accurate number actually is 1.96. Why do I make such a big meal of this number? 1.9. Have you seen 1.96 before? In any equations or something? Yes, absolutely right. When we discussed the bin uh, binomial distribution, the Poisson has when we do a proper calculation, has 1.96 in it. 1.96, that is sort of the D number. And it means actually 1.96 standard deviations, 1.96 standard deviations to the right. This contains pretty much 95% of the data. And people have asked before, where does this 1.96 come from? It comes from the normal distribution because 1.96 standard deviations to the right and 1.96 standard deviations to the left, this actually contains 95% of the data. That is what is usually known as the two sigma range. That's the two sigma range. What we can do with it, with this two sigma range, what kind of calculations we can do, I show you next week. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, have a lovely weekend. If I don't see you, no, I won't see you because we don't have any BI301 tomorrow. So have a lovely weekend. And uh, if you want to know more about normal distribution and these things, there are lots of YouTube videos. So enjoy and uh, enjoy the enhancement week or what's left of it. Take care and be good. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Bye bye.